Welcome back to War Economy and State. This is our foreign policy podcast for the Mises Institute. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor here at the Mises Institute. And joining me, as always, is my co-host, Zachary Yost, our uh, ongoing expert on foreign policy and also especially filling in all those holes of knowledge that I've got about East Asia. Um because I am no expert on China. And we're going to talk a little bit about China today and Taiwan. And uh, there's some, uh, some new information that I think provides a good jumping off point to talk about this. Uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, has a new report that came out this month. It's called The First Battle of the Next War, War Gaming, a Chinese Invasion of Taiwan. The authors on that are Mark Kansian, Matthew Kansian, and Eric Higginbotham, in case you're interested, in case you want to look it up. Uh, but I think it provides a good uh, place to start sort of an update on what the deal is with China and Taiwan. Zach and I have talked about this in the past, some of the uh, strategic issues that China faces in terms of population, in terms of dealing with all of its border disputes, in terms of uh, its budgetary limitations. Nevertheless, uh, it does have the ability to attempt an invasion and annexation of Taiwan. The question is, how easily can they pull it off? And what does that even mean for the United States? There's so much discussion in the U.S. about how the U.S. must intervene and prevent this horrible thing from happening. The question is, okay, does that have anything to do with the defense of the United States? Um, and we'll just kind of get into how this, I guess, this seems to be the new domino theory uh, in effect, uh, where we're incorporating now the Ukraine war into Taiwan and the United States must intervene everywhere at all times or the dominoes will just fall until the Chinese are uh, in Monterey, Mexico, next thing you know. So let's just look at how important is this and what would victory look like for the United States in Taiwan, even in the more optimistic scenarios. So, Zach, it's great to have you with me. Let's just look at what these war games show and uh, just kind of go through some of the scenarios and and on a tactical level, what does this mean for the United States? So maybe just really start out with uh, providing kind of a basic summary of what the report says, and then maybe we could go through some of the scenarios. <laughs> Right. So this was a very interesting report. It's very long. It's like 120 or 40 pages or something. But the, the basic premise is that um, all of the war games so far, for the most part, regarding a war where China tries to conquer Taiwan are basically classified government-run war games. And uh, so this war game was run... Uh, with all open source information that, you know, the public can find <laughs> um, if they dig down hard enough. And an interesting thing to note is, and the report itself notes this, is that uh, while these government-run war games remain classified, people who have participated in them uh, generally all agree that the U.S. loses uh, in a Chinese attack on Taiwan. This report uh, says basically that the United States would win in the most in most of the scenarios they run, which they consider the base case scenarios. Um, but it's uh, verges on being a Pyrrhic victory. Um, there are massive, massive losses. Um, in the end, victory, with victory being defined as Taiwan remains de facto independent, is the result. But the cost is astronomical and is actually, it's like hard for us to actually <laughs> contemplate what this war would mean. And it's sort of, uh, they pull an economist move and assume a can opener. They just say, nuclear weapons aren't used. But um, <laughs> even short of nuclear weapons being used... Uh, this is not 
this would not be something to take lightly. There would be thousands of dead Americans, uh, tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars of destroyed equipment, all within the first three to four weeks of this conflict. Well, it's important to always keep in mind the United States has not been in a conflict with a peer nation since 1945. And so it's been a long time since Americans could expect something where there was any chance of quick, fast, deadly uh, military engagements that would be perceived as disastrous back home. You can say, well, what about the Vietnam War? What about the Korean War? Uh, well, first of all, the Vietnam War was very, very long, um, and there was a long ramp-up period, and it did not encompass significant amounts of naval warfare, and you didn't have, like, whole boats full of sailors going down, uh, thousands of people at once in a short time period, and these are the sorts of things that happened in World War II, right, and also in World War I to a certain extent, huge huge battles. And so it was, uh, yeah, clearly the Vietnam War was a terrible idea uh, from the U.S. perspective. And the Viet Cong did benefit uh, from foreign weapons and such and were able to mount like some real air defense and things like that. So, of course, even if you count that, then it's been 50 years since that sort of thing was going on. And even that doesn't compare to the, to a situation where the United States is fighting a state like Germany. And so what does this generation have to even consider in terms of something that would look like war? What, what are we going off of? The Gulf War from 1991? Or what's going on now where there aren't even more than a, a, a token amount of troops in Ukraine uh, who are not uh, putting themselves in harm's way for political reasons. It's because I think they sense that large casualties that are inflicted on the U.S. would be politically disastrous for the regime. Um, but this would be very, very different. And so I guess the question is, how much then is the U.S. willing to put on the line to defend Taiwan. And it looks like in most of these scenarios, the U.S. does actually get very directly involved. It's 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 got a base of operations in Japan in many cases. It's uh, it's getting involved in naval conflicts and such. And so this just anyone under eighty doesn't really have memories of this sort of thing happening. So it would be really remarkable to see some of that stuff play out. But what does so what does the best case scenario look like in this case? Uh, well, so there's sort of three different tranches of um, war games they run. One is the base scenarios, um, where they fiddle around with different assumptions. Then there is the optimistic scenario, which is where uh, the U.S. and Japan manage to just basically blow the Chinese float, uh, fleet out of the water before they barely even reach Taiwan. So that's the best case scenario. It's also unlikely. And it's unlikely because of Chinese air defenses. Um, uh, China, it's, I mean, estimated that China can sink any vessel within 500 miles of its coastline. Uh, this uh, report generally notes that in most scenarios, 90% of U.S. aircraft that are in theater, so this is in bases in Japan, this is uh, Guam, Wake Island, places like that, would be destroyed on the ground. Um, so the Chinese defensive technology is going to make it very difficult for the U.S. to uh, strike in theater. So a lot of the scenarios, um, one, like one variable they change around in the base case um, game is whether or not certain very long-range standoff munitions that would be fired from aircraft uh, would be able, to, the, the, the ground attack variant, if it would be able to successfully target, uh, have an anti-ship function. Um, and the, there's all sorts of talk about logistics because the anti-ship variant of this missile is a, a very, very low stock and things like that. They also note uh, a key variable is <laughs> success 
successful hit rate of different kinds of missiles, which is basically impossible to accurately predict until, I mean, it's tested in combat. And as you noted, we've not really had combat <laughs> of this nature. Um, a key, I mean, the U.S. has spent gajillions of dollars in missile defense. I mean, the Patriot missile is the, you know, our standard missile. And then there's this new missile that they're sort of bringing online at great expense. Uh, during the Gulf, the first you know, Gulf War, the uh, Patriot missile system had like a success rate of like 8 to 15 percent. I mean, it was like a, a national scandal. Um, and they, the, the military claims that during the invasion of Iraq, the Patriot had like a close to perfect record. Yet, all that information is still classified. <laughs> so um, we, we don't know actually how well it would work. Um, I should note, by the way, that uh, for someone of my age, I was in junior high school during that war, and I watched a lot of CNN at the time. And I remember just the the full blown propaganda that we were being handed. We were told the Patriot Act was, or the uh, <laughs> Patriot missiles, were just this miracle of technology. I remember seeing some rally on Patriot missiles that I think George H. W. <laughs> Bush uh, was speaking at, and I mean the crowd, the throng was wild with joy. And uh, we were told it was just like a near perfect system and it saved Israel and uh, like nothing, uh, nothing hit any of its targets as long as you had Patriot missiles around. And that's just what we were told. And so, of course, years later, then you, you start to get the reality. And so, I mean, that's just get prepared for total BS about uh, our successes if you do get a war like this, because, yeah, you're not going to be told anything that's accurate about the actual situation. Um, but continue. I just wanted to note that the, <laughs> that uh, we we were lied to in a big way uh, the the first time the Patriot missiles were used, and I, I'm sure we can expect something similar to occur in a in another conflict. Right, and I mean uh, the ubiquitousness of smart smartphones uh, means that the government's going to have a very hard time, you know, covering up huge disasters. Um, and um, the, in all of the base case scenarios, which are like sort of the most realistic situations uh, that the, the gamers ran, the U.S. loses two aircraft carriers. Uh, an aircraft carrier has a crew of about 5,000 people on it. The report also notes that there are basically no plans in place. I mean, it's not like the... A ship just sinks and that's it. Uh, a ship could be disabled and it could be potentially repaired. There are still, there'd be thousands of people who are still alive, but they're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean within the range of Chinese missiles. So how are those sailors going to be rescued? I mean, we could have a situation where an aircraft carrier is disabled, sinking. There are thousands of sailors still alive, but there's no way to rescue them. The report notes, like, we really need to figure that out. <laughs> uh, um, th the, uh, th then there, the run some scenarios where China does better. Um, one, the, basically the only scenario they have where China outright wins is where Japan and the United States do not fight in the war. And the report claims, like, we are not making any recommendations as to whether or not the U.S. should defend Taiwan. But they basically say, if the U.S. doesn't defend Taiwan, Taiwan will be destroyed and it'll happen very rapidly. And this is where I have some pushback on this report. Um, for one thing, uh, when the Taiwanese military has run war games, in basically all of the scenarios uh, that they have run and are reported to us, the public, uh, via Ian Easton in his book, The Chinese Invasion Threat, uh, China does not win. Um, even in the uh, 
like very long run, like China has secured a foothold on Taiwan. It's basically this long, drawn out slugfest. Uh, Taiwan is an extremely defensible island. And uh, I talk about this at length in my report, Victory Without Battle, A Smarter Vision for U.S.-Taiwan Policy. And my basically the gist of my argument in that white paper is that the United States can assist Taiwan in remaining de facto independent by deterring Chinese invasion, by supplying Taiwan, selling Taiwan billions and billions and billions of dollars of weapons that would persuade China that it's a very risky gamble to attack, and that the United States, I argue, does not have to participate militarily in such a conflict in order to defeat China. Now, this is a controversial position. The authors of this paper obviously disagree. Um, and the future is radically uncertain. I mean, the only way to know for sure were for it to happen, which would certainly be a disaster of you know, historical proportions. But I think these war games are very helpful in pointing out flaws in our current strategy on a global scale. And it's especially useful in identifying why our policy regarding Ukraine is the height of foolishness. Uh, for like a decade now, U.S. policymakers have talked about where we need to pivot to China. China is the true threat. And I tend to view China as not likely to be a huge threat, but I can certainly see the importance of hedging against China and that China is certainly much more a threat, even if it is a small threat, than Russia is. Yet, and as we discussed in our episode on the... Uh, national security strategy, the U.S. government's official policy is that there is nothing beyond our capabilities. Yet, uh, this report makes very clear that trade-offs, in fact, do exist. Uh, we, we live in a world of scarcity, <laughs> a core fact of human existence. And the uh, more resources we uh, send to Ukraine, the less we have to sell to Taiwan. And uh, the report notes quite accurately, <laughs> I would say, that you cannot pull a Ukraine strategy with Taiwan. If this war were to erupt, it would not be possible to resupply Taiwan, to send them weapons, to put troops on Taiwan. In one scenario, they do try and send a brigade of Marines to Taiwan. Two-thirds are killed in air. I mean, you want to talk about a disaster. <laughs> I mean, like 2,000 people would be killed in air in like one day. Um, so I think this report, while I disagree with some of its conclusions, I think it's really helpful in trying to get us to focus on the realities of, you know, material existence. <laughs> well, and note that when we're talking about troops being killed, American troops being killed, these are costly trained combat troops in a lot of these cases who are a minority of the military strength, right? It's not like everyone in the military is a trained combat uh, troop in, in that, right? Mo you got boatloads of logistics people, all that uh, tooth to tail ratio stuff, right? You've got like at least seven people that are supporting each combat troop. Um, but once you start sending those people into a combat zone and they're killed by the thousands, the United States is back to a situation where it's got to retrain a bunch of new people because. The you can point to and say, oh, yeah, well, the military strength of the U.S. is hundreds of thousands of people. Well, what percentage of those are trained combat people? I mean, this so you, you, that that scarcity is real also. It's not like, well, actually, Russia has been a good example of that, right? Once you start to have a bunch of combat people die, well, it takes a whole lot of time to train them, to bring people in, to put them into place. And the U.S. would find itself in a similar situation. It's not just 
uh, weapons that would uh, be lost, ships that would be lost, but also all these human beings where even ignoring the human element of it are especially scarce in terms of people that have actual experience uh, in terms of doing these sorts of engagements. So uh, you run out of those people real quick when, when you start sending them into situations where thousands die in a single day. And so that would be just absolutely disastrous as well. But yeah, as you note, we're talking about the fact that Ukraine would have run out of ammunition long, long ago had the West not been giving it uh, boatloads of arms. And the same the potential is there for Taiwan. And if you want Taiwan to then be able to mount any sort of sustained defense, you've got to load it up with weapons before the fact, because you can just encircle the island as the Chinese Navy. The, the entire western frontier of Ukraine remains connected to Europe, and they they just keep pushing more arms in through that, that western border. But that's not going to happen with Taiwan, nothing like that at all. And so, yeah, you can't make any comparison at all. And it's easy to see how the Chinese could even see that if Russia loses in Ukraine— that doesn't even preclude, then, a, a Chinese invasion. I keep seeing these claims that, well, the United States must win in Ukraine, or that will send a message to China that they have carte blanche to invade Taiwan. I don't think, tactically, the two have much in common at all. And China isn't Russia in terms of the resources available to it. And the... The Chinese Navy is a lot more relevant in the situation than is the Russian Navy in the Ukraine situation. And uh, so it's just, I, I just don't see a big comparison. It's just the same old lazy sort of thing where they tried to claim that, well, if the commies succeed in Vietnam, then they'll just, they'll just succeed everywhere. And, uh, and they'll never run out of resources. There, there won't be any local guerrilla resistance, homegrown, and... They'll just be free to act globally. And that was, uh, I guess, a key part of the domino theory then was that, yeah, the commies essentially have no scarcity. And we need, that's always needs to be noted, right, is that we're talking about the our scarcity that the United States would face, which is real and would drive up costs for us significantly, cost human life, also um, force cuts in popular political programs that require uh, funding because you'd have to shift money to uh, defense spending and then just get ready for more inflation. Because how are they going to make up for that gap where they need to just start uh, spending huge amounts of new money on the China-Taiwan war? They're just going to have to print it because they, they, they're they going to need to either keep uh, interest rates low so they can just... Um, keep churning out more debt, so that requires the Fed to buy up a lot of that. Or who knows what sort of scheme they might come up with where the Fed just straight up prints money, uh, like, kind of like the trillion-dollar coin idea. Who knows what they might come up with in that sort of situation? And I'm sure they would think they could justify anything under claims that uh, national security required it. Uh, but China faces huge scarcity problems as well. We've discussed that in previous episodes, right, in terms of its standard of living is so much lower than ours. How much can they ask of the Chinese population? Well, they can probably get away with driving down the standard of living a lot more than you get away with in the United States before you start to get real resistance because they just don't have uh, the avenues for resistance in China that Americans have against war. So um, that... It's impossible to predict then. When will the realities of scarcity slap the Chinese regime in the face versus when will they slap the Americans in the face? Which will outlast the other? I, I like the report, have a hard time seeing a situation where the Chinese succeed uh, on a tactical level here, simply because what, what have they got going for them in terms of that? The United States is just so huge. Um, but just because they manage, even if they did manage to uh, uh, lose quickly, the just the amount of cost that would require the United States uh, to expend is really just quite remarkable. And that that would affect all the other theaters that the United States thinks that uh, it it is in charge of and responsible for. Right. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, the report notes that they just uh, assume the rest of the world stays the same, but that that would not be the case in reality. Um, and yes, you're exactly right when it comes to Chinese scarcity. Um, I believe the report, this is all war gaming in 2026. So that's pretty recent. And they do a comparison between the Allied Amphibious Landing Force for D-Day and Chinese landing capabilities. I mean, it is, I mean, the difference is insane. I mean, on D-Day, the Allies landed almost 100,000 troops on the first day. They had hundreds and hundreds, like thousands of landing craft. China does not possess those. And they won't, even if they <laughs> just started a mad construction program for a very long time. So that's an important thing to note. And I, regarding uh, China and the, the popular, you know, popular discontent, I think this report strengthens my argument as to why an, an attempt to invade Taiwan is so unlikely in the first place, because it's such a risky gamble. And the odds of success are so low. And, I mean, as we just saw where, I mean, the Chinese uh, government is, in a way, responsive to the Chinese people. I mean, they, they dropped their zero COVID policy because the country was having a breakdown. People were going nuts over it. I mean, rightly so. I mean, it's crazy what they were doing. But... Uh, I mean, in some of the scenarios the gamers ran, like 30,000 Chinese troops were captured and stranded on Taiwan. I mean, just like we would have like a, you know, a collective societal breakdown if, you know, two aircraft carriers were sunk in two weeks, the Chinese population would also, you know, be perturbed at a disaster. And even though they have all the censorship and the great... Great wall, firewall, word would get out. I mean, you can't, I mean, it would not, thanks to smartphones and the internet, keeping a clamp on these disasters is, I would say, next to impossible. Um, but to get back to the material aspect, I think it, um, to, get, to get back to sort of trade offs, uh, there's just some realities that uh, American planners need to face. For one thing, there is a $19 billion backlog in uh, Taiwanese weapons orders. So Taiwan has it is all, this, all these orders for various weapon systems and whatnot has all been approved by Congress. It's gone through everything. Now they're just waiting for it to be built. <laughs> um, and yet at the same time, we are rapidly depleting our own stockpiles of weapons by sending them to Ukraine, which I would argue is, uh, I mean, I, of course, wish the people of Ukraine well. It's awful what is happening. But uh, Ukrainian independence uh, or territorial integrity is ultimately not a, uh, a core national interest of the United States. So... We are, I mean, some by some reports, we have given a third of our entire stockpile of Javelin missiles to Ukraine. Whereas <laughs> in my order of priorities, we should be selling a third of our stockpile <laughs> to Taiwan. Uh, I mean, CSIS uh, actually had a very recent report looking at some of the U.S. stockpiles and how long it would take to replace things we've sent to Ukraine. Stinger missiles, even if the, you know, uh, military industrial complex gets to a uh, surge rate of production, it would take six and a half years to restore our Stinger missile uh, stockpile. Yet they note that at the current rate of production, it would take 18 years. Uh, a huge, um, we, we've sent over a million rounds of artillery to Ukraine. And the report notes, I mean, of course, this is all open source information. We don't know exactly what Taiwan's stockpile of artillery shells is. But under their gaming scenario, uh, Taiwan ran out of artillery shells within three months. 
of a in, in their in the Taiwan stands alone scenario. Um, the U.S. at uh, <laughs> it we could at current rates of artillery shell production, it is not possible to replace the shells we've sent to Ukraine because the entire yearly production quota is used up in U.S. training exercises. So at a surge rate of production, it would take five years to just restore the U.S. stockpile that it has sent to Ukraine thus far, as of the time this report came out. Um, uh, even if, uh, I mean, it's just sort of, it seems people don't get that it's not like we can just flip a switch and all these factories spring out of nowhere to start making artillery shells. Those resources, you know, would be going to build something else <laughs> uh, and are now going to be used to make artillery shells. Um, so, I mean, I would say if you have a few million dollars laying around, opening an artillery shell plant would be a good investment for the future <laughs> um, because it, I mean, they're just, uh, going to be in drastic demand, both in the war in Ukraine, but also in Taiwan. And the report notes, this this uh, second report that we'll link in the show notes, uh, notes that the U.S. has literally been scouring the globe, trying to buy up just all these stockpiles of weapons to send to Ukraine because we, uh, you know, it takes years to get production lines up and running and everything. And we literally cannot supply Ukraine with enough weapons. So say this nightmare scenario were to occur where China, it becomes clear they're going to attack Taiwan, where <laughs> there's not going to be any weapons left <laughs> uh, to ship them unless, you know, the U.S. dramatically alters its uh, military industrial base which has trade-offs, you know. Uh, we can't make widgets if we're making artillery shells. And I would argue we need to be making some more artillery shells. And it'd be great if we're selling these artillery shells to Taiwan, definitely not just handing them over for free. But uh, it just seems this reality, this basic reality of scarcity of human life seems to evade most analysts. Even in the 60s, when you had few people on Social Security, you had a young population cranking out production, the U.S. under Johnson was still running huge deficits, like the hugest in its history. And of course, they look tiny now in retrospect. But at the time, on the economic base uh, at the time, the U.S. was <clears throat> driving new surges in inflation, which we then saw play out in the 1970s as they had to impose price controls because the inflation was so bad by the 70s. That was driven by the whole guns and butter policy of the time. But given the, the more unpleasant economic situation we're facing now with just so much more debt, so much more money from the budget is going to have to go to debt service, we're facing just interest on the debt topping 500 billion, 600 billion. Uh, a new report came out from the CBO say you could start to get up toward, by 2030, up toward a trillion dollars uh, a year in terms of just servicing the debt because so much of it is just premised on interest rates being at one and one percent, one and a half percent, two percent maybe. But if you're just in a world of just 4% inflation or uh, interest rates, which isn't exactly like crazy, that you're, you're, you've, that's siphoning all of that budget money away. So where are you going to get all of this money? Because the, the current budget is, what, $800 billion in defense spending? Or at least soon will be there if it's not already there. Yeah, it's higher there because they, they, uh, they don't count things right as the DOD that should be you know broadly counted yes, under that. like but yeah the official enormous. Pentagon number is uh, like somewhere around 800 and so what now you're that's going to be overtaken even by payment on the debt not to mention social security and you're going to have fewer workers so you're going to start to hear a lot more and of course I would be favoring this just independently but it would be stupid if it were driven by a war raising the retirement age to 75, right? Because we got to cut back on social security to pay for this war for more munitions. We got to start more factories. Oh, the price of steel. Well, that's way, way up now. So 
uh, say hello to more expensive automobiles uh, or anything that has all of these important electronic components in it. It's all going to weapons now. So you can just see higher prices everywhere. So you've got not only more money printing that needs to take place to take care of both debt service and defense spending, but it's also all of that government spending is going to then drive up prices and all of these goods. So then you get a, a basically a double whammy on price inflation, driven both by monetary inflation and rising government demand for all of these goods and services to handle the war. So your real wages just went down, buddy, so that uh, we can now try and make up for these huge amounts of munitions we shipped to Ukraine for a war that has zero to do with U.S. national security. And that, of course, all assumes that you think, Ch I agree with you, right? Like, I don't even think that China poses a, a huge immediate threat to the United States, but certainly more so than Russia does, like by orders of magnitude. So just this policy of just shipping every last resource we've got to Ukraine is just insane because it what it says to the world is, OK, we're going to neglect all the other parts of the globe that we say we have full capability to wage six different wars ongoing at any given time. Everybody knows that's BS now because for all those numbers you just quoted, it's take years to get back to our old munitions levels. And then we're just not even in a position economically to pull it off without facing rising inflation, declining social benefits, all these sorts of things that uh, the domestic population isn't going to be real keen on. And that's on top of all that. I mean, we could speculate, right? How would the American population react if a couple of aircraft carriers went down? I mean, what would that look like, right? Would, 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 would the media then side with the military and convince us that somehow those troops were alive somewhere? I mean, I don't, I don't know what they would try. But I mean, I think Nuke Beijing would be trending on Twitter. Is that it? I mean, back when um, back when the ambassador to Libya was killed in Benghazi, I mean, even you know, quote unquote, normies were like, "We need to carpet bomb the country." You know, I mean, like if like ten thousand Americans were killed in a few weeks, not to mention, you know. Hundreds of aircraft destroyed on the ground and uh, dozens of ships destroyed. I mean, the people would be frothing mad. I mean, it would be like we would be on the escalation train with no brakes, I think. I mean, it would be war fervor <laughs> would grip the country. There'd be demands for strikes on mainland China in retaliation. I mean, uh, I think, I mean, like, this is an issue that. Japan faced, actually, in the lead up to World War II is, uh, I mean, for various reasons, after the Meiji Restoration, there was all this effort to cultivate nationalism among the populace. And it got to the point where the populace had this sort of nationalist fervor that the Japanese leadership could not control. <laughs> so I think uh, we might be in a similar situation were this to come to fruition. And just to go back to the, you know, long-term costs, interest costs on the debt and whatever, if people are interested, they can see a tiny microcosm of this in, uh, I believe it's the Watson Institute for the Study of War, I think it's called at Brown University, they have had this long-running project calculating the costs, both human and monetary, of the war on terror. And they've calculated it out, you know, because so much of this money was borrowed. It, there's literally, the war on terror is going to cost trillions more dollars in interest alone, and not only interest, but you also have to factor in that, you know, thousands of American service personnel will be maimed and wounded and will require medical care for the rest of their lives. That will also, I can't remember what the uh, their figure is on how much they estimate that's going to cost, but it is, it's astronomical. And it just keeps getting bigger because uh, all the money's borrowed in the first place. So, I mean, I think it really drives home the importance of uh, taking a sober look at one, U.S. grand strategy overall, and are we acting with our actual national interests in mind, especially in regards to Ukraine policy? And two, what, what it means for the U.S. to actually defend Taiwan and how this would be 
uh, sort of beyond our comprehension in terms of being a disaster, even if victory is achieved. And therefore, <laughs> that we need to, you know, look at ways in which Taiwan, we can assist Taiwan and Japan in deterring a Chinese invasion to begin with, without us getting, you know, entangled in what would be a, a catastrophe uh, of, you know, not anything anyone living really has experienced. Well, and I've noticed, though, that, uh, and this, I think this will be our last uh, thing we'll discuss here, where uh, you can say all of these facts and figures, right, about <laughs> the economic realities of the situation, uh, about the costs involved, but there's still going to be that sizable portion of the population that's going to that's going to treat all that with hand waving and they're going to virtue signal and say well me i'm not willing to sacrifice the ukrainians or the taiwanese to conquest and enslavement by foreign powers i care about humanity so no cost is too high for me to deal with that and there's these people, of course, live in a fantasy land, and very rarely, only a teeny tiny percentage of them do they actually ever volunteer to go pay the real cost uh, involved in these sorts of conflicts. But I think we'll probably encounter a bunch of that, right? Oh, how can how can you just say that you need to abandon Ukraine? And that you shouldn't, uh, of course, be putting boots on the ground in Taiwan in order to defend Taiwan from uh, a Chinese invasion. And there's just really no limits to these people on the moral level, right? And so I think you're still going to have to deal with that. Of course, I guess at some point you just you just have to deal with reality. So even in Washington, those people, I suppose, they just have to to admit, okay, we don't even have enough planes then to keep this campaign going, no matter how many thoughts and prayers we want to send to Taiwan, we don't have like actual guns to send them. And so I would expect that to continue. But I, I, do you get the sense that 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 moralistic humanitarian intervention side of things is still significant in the debate, or is are we at the point where it uh, really is dominated more by just the the realistic realities of what is even possible in terms of this conflict? Or are we still just thinking in terms of the United States uh, helps its friends no matter what everywhere on the globe and we can't let anyone be oppressed? Um, unless, of course, they're in Africa or in some country we don't care about and then we don't care how many of those people die. But we have decided that Taiwan and Ukraine... Um, are, uh, we must stand with them, and that those are the current thing. And notice that no one's talking about invading China to free Tibet, which of course has lived under the jackboot of the Beijing regime for a long, long time. But for whatever reason, Taiwan deserves every last dime of the Americans. And so is, uh, how much should we expect of the humanitarian side to try and distract us from the more material realities? I think at least the rhetoric is always going to be there. And I'd sort of argue it's sort of like the uh, uh, the, the yin-yang of American foreign policy. We can look historically, you know, all the way to the beginning, Washington's farewell address, uh, John Quincy Adams, go not, uh, you know, don't go in search of monsters to destroy and all that. Yet at the same time, from the very beginning, there has also been this other side that never was winning for the first hundred or so years, of America, we're not just the city on the hill. It is our duty to descend from our glorious enlightened hill to liberate all the benighted, you know, oppressed peoples of the world. And I mean, one of the first times this happened, one, I mean, all the way back, people wanted to become involved in the French Revolutionary Wars. The Greek wars of independence were a huge cause of, uh, you know, among, you know, educated people who had this romantic view, which is just hilarious as a side note, because so many of the Greek revolutionaries were literally like bandits. But um, I, it's always going to be there. Robert Nisbet has this good line in his book, The Present Age, uh, where it's just like, 
the basis of American foreign policy has have been like I can't remember what year he gave, but since then has been just moralism. <laughs> uh, yet people like uh, um, uh, uh, John Mearsheimer also argue that in the end, material realities probably will, the uh, policymakers at least will face material realities to some degree or another, uh, despite uh, rhetoric necessarily. Um, uh, so I think some people would argue policymakers will own up to reality, yet at the same time, it doesn't seem like they're really doing that yet, at least. All right, well, we'll have to let that be the last word on this episode of War, Economy, and State. Thank you, Zach, for joining me, and we'll be back next month with another episode. And until then, have a great month. Mm-hmm.